everyone, it's your favourite Atomic Blonde here with a little bit of Sunday lunch. It's been a while. Um, finally sort of getting back into my routine. I have a few weekends back now, <laughs> which is nice, um, before the summer avalanche of barbecues hits, which I can't wait for. Um, we actually have some nice weather here in the UK. It's lasted a whole week. Can you believe that? The sun is shining. Um, there are birds chirping outside. I don't know if you can quite make that out, but they are singing. So uh, what a better time to uh, jump on, have a quick chat about what's going on in the old uh, pop culture world and uh, a few updates on what I've been watching. Obviously, this time of year, things slow down. Most of my shows, unfortunately, <laughs> coming to an end, either complete series finales or season finales. And... Uh, Really, the sort of summer months, um, it's a bit of hit and miss if we get anything good to watch. Um, but then we obviously start getting the uh, summer blockbusters coming out, So, uh, which I touched on last week in the uh, Atomic Pop chat. So go check that out about what I'll be watching, hopefully, go the summer. So I'm still on the fence with a couple of them, and I think you are too. <laughs> but uh, hey, so anyway, shall we get into it? I think so. So... Which picture shall we have? I think we'll go with this one. That's the one. <laughs> Let's just see, shall we? Anyway, yeah, so Sunday lunch it is. Um, as we know, it's sort of Sunday lunch. I do a little bit of little bit of everything. So what I've been watching, what am I interested in? And um yeah, so first on the list we have Citadel. So obviously I've, I've spoken about this a couple of times. I was fortunate, fortunate enough to see the first episode before it aired, uh, about three or four months before it came out, to comment on it. And um, yeah, I mean, I thought, I thought the first episode had a lot of promise. Um, it's uh, sort of ticked along at quite a good pace. Um, I think overall it's not a bad, bad show. I quite enjoyed it. So I finally watched the season finale. Um, I know it's only six episodes and it seems to take me a while to get through them. I don't think that's actually a reflection of the show. Uh, obviously, the acting was very good. The cast was great. Um, I think some of the storyline was a little bit predictable. Um, but I did like the season finale. So spoilers coming up, as always, with my reviews. So finally, we, we kind of got to um, the whole way through. We knew that someone inside Citadel had betrayed them. It was kind of a bit of a, a who done it, really. The, this whole lead up was like who who sold out Citadel. It was very heavily looking towards um, it was Nadia's character, um, uh, and uh, in the last uh, the, the penultimate episode, we found out that she the reason she kind of disappeared was that she got pregnant and she's had Mason's baby, um, and all her shady behaviour was actually trying to protect her daughter. And made sure that the rival agency um, couldn't get hold of her. Um, so this episode, um, yeah, so they, they find out a way that they they could generate this serum, which obviously gives them their memories back. Because we found out this very early on, they, they basically they could be injected with a serum that completely wiped their memories. Hence why Mason didn't know who he was. Um, so in the event they get captured. Um, they literally can't give up any secrets because they they have no memory. It's all been wiped. So he has this dilemma that obviously he's got a wife and a child who he's lived with for like the last eight years um, in his new identity. So um, does he does he take the serum and become Mason? And what effect will that have that have on his current relationship? But if he has if he becomes Mason again, he'll remember the relationship he had with Nadia. And he's also found out that he's um, Nadia's daughter's father. So he's effectively got two, two, two families, two partners. So not unsurprisingly, he opts to get his memory back. He feels like he has to. Um, and these will come crashing down on him. Um, and two, there's two revelations that, that, that from this. So the big, bad, um, psychotic English woman, because obviously all the bad guys are English in America. Makes change for it to be a woman, but you know. So the psycho <laughs> who's been trying to tear down Citadel, we find out is actually his mother. Um, Mason's father was killed. Um, 
in Serbia, so the, the uh, Serbia Bosnian um, conflict uh, back 30 odd years ago now. Um, turns out it was a citadel airstrike that did it. They were given false information. They thought they were taking out a terrorist cell, but they basically took out a UN camp. Um, she persuades Mason to give up Citadel. And she'll take them to, through the courts and uh, bring them down or, or certainly get them to take responsibility as it was always, um, it was all covered up. Um, in some sort of twisted uh, sense of trying to, a, to get, you know, he kind of believed that naively, but I think also just trying to um, be something to his mother or some sort of knowledge that his mother loves him because we also find out that she sort of, you know, after his father died, she had nothing to do with him. Um, he, he he gave up all the, all the agents, so he's actually the mole. Um, when he's asked, like, have you got your memory back? He's just like, I don't know, I'm not sure. Because obviously he's scared to reveal this information, um, and uh, you know they managed to get Nadia's kid back, all of that. So really, the cliffhanger was that yes, he he was the mole all along. She's his mother now. Obviously now he remembers that she's his mother. There's a whole thing, but obviously she's been trying to kill him. She's been trying to kill her own son. So he kind of gave up his his spy family, his friends. For nothing you know he really doesn't mean anything to her so overall you know i think it was a good little twist that she was his mother um but you know I, i'd say there, there's nothing really new in this show it what it didn't really sort of blow me away it was good it was watchable um if there's gonna be a season two i'd, I'd watch it they have advertised there's gonna be a sort of a citadel universe and the next one is citadel i think it said diana i think it was called um in 2024 which is a different spy um these characters don't appear to be in it which is a bit strange so whether we are going to get a continuation of this story i assume we will because it's a it, it doesn't really end per se we just got he knows that he's given them all up obviously he, does he take revenge on his mother does he confess what happens with his marriage um does he get back with nadia etc 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 so I think it's worth a watch, definitely. There's much worse things on TV right now, but it didn't blow me away the way I was hoping it would. Um, yeah, so, and again, it's apparently rumoured 300 million for six episodes. I can't see where they spent the money. I guess a lot of it was all on CGI because obviously they're jumping out of planes and they're swimming down and they're on submarines and they're travelling around the world, which I guess is all sort of uh, visual effects these days. They very rarely actually leave the comforts of the studio. So I guess that's where it went. But uh, yeah, not bad, not bad, not great. Good acting. Um, story hung together, a few twists and turns, worth watch. So go check out Citadel on Amazon Prime. So moving on to a spot of news. This is hilarious. For me, this is, I think, the mainstream media circling the wagons you know the wind's not blowing in the right direction <laughs> the worm is um for indy 5 this looks like it's going to absolutely tank um you know you pretty much got mission impossible 7 coming out hot on the hills i think it's only gonna be out like a week maybe two um and obviously the views from the the critics coming out of cans were not good um some of the leaks on reddit you know, have every, everybody rolling their eyes, everything we said it was going to be, you know, bait and switch, and insufferable very soon, all seems to be playing out. So this this article, uh, or several articles have suddenly appeared saying, Star Wars producer exposes toxic fan culture attacking Kathleen Kennedy, and the toxic, and various, con you know, uh, uh, variations of this uh, headline, toxic fans, Star Wars toxic fans, blah, 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 blah. And basically saying that the um, producer, Tony Gilroy, who was the producer for um, Andor, was slagging off the fans. Now, actually, uh, the reason I say I think the mainstream media are sort of circling the wagons is to, to like, I say, if indie bombs, they're already trying to tear up that 
The fans have got it in for her. They never had any intentions of going to see it. And, you know, she's a legend in Hollywood, blah, blah, blah. Because when you actually watch the interview with Tony Gilroy, he was asked a certain question around the fans. And I think they were hoping he'd give this kind of answer. And in fairness to Tony, he really, really didn't. He just kind of went on to say that, you know, fans are very passionate. The fans love this uh, franchise. And, um, you know, and he he and his his um, uh, production crew were a mixture of kind of what he, he says, like normies. But there was also people on the show who absolutely love Star Wars as well and kind of sort of, they sort of blend the two. And, you know, uh, he wants to deliver a good product for those fans. And, yes, there's pressure there because they do love it so much. But, you know, all, all the sort of feedback and, and what comes from the fans comes from a place of love, effectively. Now, what they latched on to is that he said that Kathleen Kennedy gets a really hard time, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, paraphrasing, but, you know, he wouldn't want her job for all the tea in China, you know, kind of whatever you do, you're going to get criticised. And they're completely twisted, which, you know, she does get a lot of stick, and I think justly. <laughs> But they completely just took that one, you know, uh, statement, innocent statement, and they completely twisted it into, you know, he thinks we're all toxic fans and uh, we're, we're all we're all gunning for for Kathleen. So I would say go check out um, the interview um, on RK Outpost on Ryan's channel. Ryan Canal, he has done. Um, uh, a video on it and he shows the video so if you can't be able to find the video go go to RK Outpost check that out it's a great video from Ryan covering all of this um and again he was he was sort of saying I was prepared to jump on all guns blazing and <laughs> who does Tony Gilroy I think he is but actually the guy didn't say anything the guy didn't say anything bad about fans he just said that Kathleen Kennedy gets a gets a rough rough ride which she does and as I say, justifiably. So for me, you know, this is this is the first stage of right. Let's start getting those protective shields up. Let's start um, working out how we can protect Kathleen because when Indy bombs and let's face it, is going to, there is nowhere for that woman to hide. You know, and if she manages to keep her job after that, <sighs> uh, yeah. I mean, you you know, you talk about uh, Hollywood talks about equality all the time, and um, well, equality as if if she was a man or anybody else in Hollywood, her feet wouldn't would have been kicked out the door years ago um, after uh, Rise of Skywalker bombed. Um, you know, so yeah, this is just the first shot. Um, it's also let's poke the bear, let, let's let's rile up the fans, let's get them saying some stuff so we can throw it back at them. I think all we can do is just try not to rise to this stuff, do the due diligence as Ryan did, saying, actually, what did this guy say before we start piling on him? That's uh, There's so many lines of misinformation seems to be coming out of, obviously, Disney and Lucasfilm right now, trying to cover their backsides, trying to say, you know, nothing to see here and... It's not that we're all crap at our jobs and we make crap, it's all the fans' fault. So let's, let's make sure we do the due diligence before, you know, we, we pile on these people. So I think fair play to to Tony, the producer, who actually had, um, you know, good and fair balanced things to say about the fans. So oh, there we go. <laughs> nice one, Tony. Okay, so moving on swiftly to our... Oh, manifest so we are on the home straight we are on the last season four part two the 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 the, the finale that is going to explain all of this mystery box type show that i love uh i obviously had a bit of a bumpy ride <laughs> pun intended um you know it started off on network tv we had three cracking seasons uh, it was always meant to be like a six season story arc, I believe, five or six seasons from Jeff Rake. And um, it got cancelled after three seasons, not because it wasn't popular or it wasn't getting good ratings, but they said they just couldn't afford to keep making it. So, you know, as we see a lot these days, um, <laughs> when there's a bit more ka ching, ka -ching around, the fans lobbied and it was like sort of save manifest, you know, we have to know how this show ends. <laughs> and it 
ended on a doozy on a cliffhanger season three. It was absolutely one of those where you just like the screen was like, no, what, what, what is happening? Um, so uh, and Netflix uh, picked it up. But rather than sort of completing it over another three seasons, typical Netflix fashion, they said, look, we'll give you one more season, uh, 20 episodes, finish your story. So we saw a time jump between seasons three and four uh, of two years. So effectively, you know, we kind of skipped two seasons and he had to condense those two seasons down into season four, which I think he's done an amazing job of, actually. Um, the whole time jump was handled really well. Um this, you know, we didn't lose threads. The story continued through. The plot lines were maintained. Um, things were sort of wrapped up. It wasn't just sort of jumped and they just sort of just dumped some of the storylines or threads that were running. It's been handled really, really well. So I'm up to episode 17. I've still got three to go, so I don't know how it ends yet. <laughs> but really, you know, it's very much sort of playing out that um, the, the, the passengers are kind of, in these callings they're in touch with some divine consciousness so it sort of does, it does have some quite religious uh uh overtones and is this is this god giving them the callings and um season four is kind of coming towards like the you know the the, the end of days the apocalypse and you've got on the one hand angelina who's the absolute nut job who was raised in a very religious family i think her father's a minister or pastor or something like that um and you know she's brought up knows the bible but again she's very much sort of seeing this and sort of twisting it into god's telling her to you know murder certain people or remove certain people and obviously there's, there's other people in the show who who are religious or saying well god wouldn't tell you to do that god wouldn't ask you to kill people so you kind of then on the flip side you've got cow um, they they found this sort of um, this religious artifact, this sort of blue sapphire, and it got um, uh, destroyed at the end of season four, part one. Part's gone into her hand. Some zinc cow. They're sort of like either side of the coin almost, um, and this stone enables them to project false um, callings and. Um, make you see what you want to see or make you see things etc so of course she's using it in a bad way cow's trying to use it in a good way um and you've almost kind of got you know the references to the book the 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 um, book of revelation so it was like you know they're not coming out and saying anybody's the messiah or anything like that but you've effectively kind of got the antichrist and the, you know the two sides of the coin and uh, coming to this sort of final battle and who's going to win that's kind of how it's all teed up to play out, whether it's going to be that literal or it's got nothing to do with God at all. And it's all parallel dimensions and aliens. Who knows? <laughs> These shows can go anywhere. Um, and, uh, uh, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm not a religious person and I'm still enjoying this. It hasn't gone too far down that path where you kind of go in a bit. Ugh, this is a bit heavy now. It's all getting a bit God squad. Um so they, they aren't really using terms like that, but there are occasionally references to the Bible and imagery and things like that. Um, and like the names, like the daughter's called Eden and things like that. But so far it's been handled really well. I'm really excited to see how this is going to finish. As I say, three episodes to go. Um, hopefully if it lands well, <laughs> uh, I'll do a whole video on the wonderful mystery box as R&B says gobbledygook <laughs> of manifest I love this show I love these types of shows I'm such a sucker I always end up being not always but a lot of the time you end up being disappointed because they either like if you obviously JJ Abrahams who just doesn't know how to end anything you just kind of go right okay well what about this and what about this and what about this just doesn't bother just goes mm, that's your end take it or leave it or they do end it and again it's just like oh well we kind of already guessed that so that was a bit yeah um, and every now and again you'll get a wow <laughs> boy did they nail that landing but not that often but but i am optimistic with this show the quality of writing the quality of acting over all four seasons has been superb i mean you know you've got to take it for what it is it's is a mystery box show um you have to leave you know to suspend belief leave leave it totally at the door 
and just watch, let it wash over you. Just watch it for what it is and you will have a riot. I love this show. It's so much fun. The amount of cliffhangers and, you know, it's proper binge worthy TV. I mean, obviously when it was uh, seasons one to three, it was weekly. So having to wait each week for the next episode was like, oh, felt like a lifetime. I think it's a bit of a shame that I have kind of dumped these in one go. I um, mean, obviously they have split it into parts one and two. But um, so I think it lost a little bit of its uh, va va voom as everyone on streaming with it all dropping in one go. There wasn't much noise around this final part dropping, actually. Um, I think there's much more publicity in, in America for it. But uh, um, the first three seasons over here are on... Uh, Sky or now TV and season four is on uh, Netflix so if you have access to manifest through Sky or now do go check it out it's such a good fun and journey and we'll just keep your head scratching each season's cliffhangers were just amazing and I cannot wait to see how this is going to end I'm hoping so badly it's going to be good I'm going to be gutted if it's crap <laughs> But hey, you know, I've stuck with it this far. Um, and yeah, I might do a, do, do, do a big full, this is why you should watch Manifest if it ends well. Even if it ends badly, sometimes it's worth going on the journey, isn't it? Even if it ends a little bit. Mm. If it's terrible, I won't put you through it. I'll just say, don't even start, guys. Just, just don't go there. It's just another lost. And nobody wants that on their conscience. <laughs> So anyway, next week I will tell you yay or nay, and there may be a big, bigger video coming your way. Um, the same as I've done for like 12 Monkeys, do go check that out. That's a fantastic show. So I'm digressing now. Um, I watched 12 Monkeys on the back of Picard season three. It says Terry Metalis. I got Todd Sashwick, who plays this amazing character, Deacon. Um, sort of broken, damaged, psychopath, but lovable. <laughs> I know. Um, whose ending, I just, I was just like, could not believe it. Again, timey-wimey, time travel, twisty-turny, fantastic show. Fantastic show. So again, if you sort of check out 12 Monkeys, you'll know why I like this kind of stuff. But do go check out my review. And more importantly, go check out that show. It's fantastic. Okay, moving on, moving on. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was, was this kind of came out. Um, so Tom Cruise flexes his muscles after saving theatres by begging studio execs to bump Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer for IMAX screens as a film will boot Mission Impossible 7. So, uh, so Chris, so, so obviously, uh, Nolan kind of bagged his release date for Oppenheimer when he started filming this back in 2021. Um, and as a result, you know, he's renowned for doing his films in IMAX. He's really sort of championed IMAX and that's his sort of preferred medium, I guess. Um, and um, as a result, he's literally, you know, in all theatres, every IMAX screen, his film will be showing. Now, as it says there, there's only a week and a half um, between the, this coming out and um, Richard Impossible 7 and Oppenheimer. Now, obviously, I think they're both quite different audiences. I mean, there will be some, some crossover with that kind of, obviously, Oppenheimer is not science fiction, but it's science based. So I think, I think there's a little bit of a sort of crossover there with the fan base, but I think predominantly you're going to get quite different uh, movie goers want to see Oppenheimer to to potentially um, Mission Impossible. I mean, Mission Impossible. That's you know, if you've got teenage kids, that's kind of kind of family thing to go to. I don't really think you take your kids to see Oppenheimer unless they're particularly uh, nerdy. Um, yeah, so it's a difficult one because I mean, like you know, Nolan's earned his stripes, but you know, Tom Cruise has been around a long time, and as it says here, you know. We saw loads of articles, and obviously after what Steven Spielberg said, like, you know, you pulled our ass out of the fire, mate. You saved Hollywood with, with Top Gun Maverick. So should he get dibs on IMAX? 
I don't know. But I think, you know, in terms of the money he made, I mean, like I say, if he hadn't saved theatres, certainly in America, um, there wouldn't be theatres for Oppenheimer to be shown in. Now, I'm sure there can be some sort of compromise, <laughs> you know, to get around the table. They're all big boys after all and talk this through. But I, I do kind of feel where, where Tom's coming from. I mean, at the end of the day, look, he's he's one of the last big movie stars. And um, just because you are you have that kind of stature doesn't mean you should be able to throw your weight around and, you know, automatically become top of the tree or, you know, get whatever you want. But I think he has kind of earned the right here to say, well, hang on, guys. <laughs> I made a shit ton of money for the industry last year. Um, saved Hollywood and now you're telling me I can't have my film in IMAX theatres? Really? So, I don't know, I don't know. I think, um, you know, like I say, I reckon there's some compromise there. I mean, to be fair, I'm, I'm not massively bothered about seeing things in IMAX. Um, I think certain special effects films, something like June, I'd want to go see it in IMAX uh, if you've got IMAX uh, theatres. But there, I just don't think there's so many of them in the UK, to be honest, for it to be as big a deal here. Maybe I'm wrong. Do let me know. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just sort of see how this one's going to play out, really, because, you know, no one... I could say he's kind of earned his stripes, so I don't think he's like, he's like a small director that you can just sort of push around. Um, and obviously, I think um, Oppenheimer's Universal. I don't know if Mission Possible is Universal or Paramount, because obviously Top Gun was Paramount. Um, I'm not sure which studios they're coming out of. But yeah, just kind of uh, probably, you know, good good problems to have, I guess, because the, the fact there's still theatres to put these things out in. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see how this plays out and um, who comes out top dog. Uh, um, the, the reason this kind of conflict has happened, I believe, is because obviously Tom quite rightly dug his heels in and said, no, Top Gun Maverick's coming out in the theatres. I'm not having it on streaming. So it kind of pushed everything kind of back and therefore it's, it changed the release date and um, pushed back Mission 7's release date to now cause this kind of this conflict, um, which really isn't Tom or Nolan's fault. But, um, yeah, it's like <laughs> maybe they should get in a room and do some playground insults or uh, uh, something like that or, <laughs> you know, celebrity stare out or... Um, uh, innuendo bingo to, to sort it out you know whoever wins uh, gets the IMAX theaters <laughs> who knows who knows but yeah it'll be interesting I mean it's good that we've got a few good movies coming up um again I'm like I quite fancy Oppenheimer because I do like Nolan films but I must admit I prefer he's more uh a more of a fiction sort of person than sort of real life kind of story type things but the cast is phenomenal I'm sure it will be great. And certainly visually, it's going to be absolutely stunning. I think most people are going just to uh, see how he managed to recreate a nuclear explosion using practical effects without obviously setting off a nuclear weapon. So <laughs> very intrigued to see how that comes across on the screen. Um, yeah, but again, I think it's a bit of a long one. I think it's around sort of three hours or something, and I am not good with long films. So we'll have to see, we'll have to see. But like I say, great that we've actually got some like uh, decisions to make or some debates around things being released. Cause they say this, this feels like there's so few releases now of good film or films and, and good films. Um, you know, the saga rolls on for Disney. Uh, Little Mermaid is still not doing well. It's doing okay. I think it's about 200 odd million. But it certainly looks like it's set up to um, make a loss. I saw something the other day. It said around 100 million. I don't know if that's true. Um, and uh, I think it's taken a real pounding this weekend with the release of uh, Miles Morales, whatever the something Spider-Verse. Not my thing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it'd be interesting to say how they're going to spin this. Because so far they've said... Little Mermaid's bombing because, you know, the usual racist bigots. You don't want to go see a black girl. But people go and see Miles Morales. Hmm. How does that work? 
Hollywood. How are they going to spin that narrative that all these racists aren't going to go see The Little Mermaid, but they're going to see Miles Morales? Oh, tricky. Hey, hey, you make your bed, you lie in it. <laughs> we all know it's BS from Hollywood anyway, you know. Uh, let's just say, let's not get dragged into it. That's, uh, they're gonna, I think they're going to fuel the fames, as we saw, say, with the, the Kennedy article. They're going to keep trying to, you know, uh, split fandoms, poke the bear, uh, you know, wind us up, um, and we just can't rise to it. We've just got to go, hey, I'm watching what I want to watch. We ain't rising to this nonsense anymore. We're not going to take it anymore, or something like that, you know. <laughs> Twisted Sister wasn't my thing. Wasn't my jam, man. Anyway, that's it. That's all the stories I have for this week. Um, as ever, I say that the number one story just seems to be Disney on fire, uh, which I covered last week on my Atomic uh, Pop Chat. So go check that out if you missed it. Um, go into a bit more detail around all the woes that Disney has right now, which seems to mount on a weekly basis. And I'm sorry, I can't help but laugh. So hey ho, I'm sure I will burn in hell for it. Anyway. So um, if you didn't see, I was on Facebook last night um, over on Dan Hadley's channel, um, where again, we, they talked about there's a Spider-Verse thing, Little Mermaid, um, the demise of uh, network um, uh, DVD distributors and general pop chit chat around things, top tens uh, on Prime. So go check that out, say Facebook. Uh, you can find me on there most Saturdays. Um, I've actually got a week off this Saturday coming um, as uh, people got engagements. But, um, yeah, you can normally find me there. On Sundays, I'm often doing, let's say, this Sunday lunch, so hopefully you know about that. Or I'm doing my Atomic Pop Chats. Um, I'm really, really trying to try and get some live streams up and going. It's just time for the prep. I think I might just have to just, you know, just jump on, boomer it out, <laughs> see what happens. And hopefully you guys can help me out with some chats. But anyway, I shall be back next week, hopefully with a bit more Sunday lunch. I'm sure there's something going to be going on in a pop culture world for us to talk about. And yes, was manifest. Yay. Or nay. Yeah. So anyway, have a great week. As always, please, please, please like, share and subscribe. Um, do leave me comments. What do you think about what's going on at Disney? What do you think about indie? Is it going to bomb? Um, are they just say just trying to poke the bear? So leave me comments, leave me likes. Even if you don't like it, let me know. <laughs> Any interactions, good interaction, the algorithm. So anyway, have a great week here in the UK, enjoy the sunshine while we've got it. I'm sure it'll probably be a few more days. You know, we've had a whole week. That's our summer, guys. You know, so uh, barbecue-tastic. Take care, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.